And uh, nowadays, some of the challenges that I face, uh, well, that's message that goes to my uh, Muslim brothers and sisters, is that uh, we are ambassadors of Islam. And a lot of people are looking at us, and, uh, you know, because of, you know, like, like uh, the gentleman here said, uh, there's a lot of things happening in the world nowadays, and Islam is targeted. And obviously, you know, people look at the Muslim rights. What are, I mean, what are these people doing, you know? So it's very important that we show the real values and the real teachings of Islam, uh, the message of unity, uh, the message of respect, and uh, so that people maybe, you know, will think, oh, I, one day I met this Muslim woman or this Muslim man, and it was not happening like this, I was not speaking or, you know, behaving aggressively or, you know, Inshallah. Well, thank you very much. I know I put you on the spot there, but I think that was a lovely. No, you, 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 a splendid effort. I think we should have called you up here uh, for that. But I, I think just picking up on a couple of your points, I think the seeking of knowledge, and I think when people talk about religion per se and Islam in particular, I think the important element is, and I totally accept this, when we look, unfortunately, across the world at the moment, the way Islam is presented. I do not get this notion of radicalization, which happens, because to me, the, even the, uh, the use of the word fundamentalist, fundamental, last time I looked it up in the dictionary, means basics. You know, you go back to the basic tenets of the faith. And the basic tenets of the faith are so far removed from these people who hijack a faith and present it in the way they do. Yet it is unfortunate we live in, a, in an age where such statements are, get greater grounding, uh, get much more uh, headlines. I'm uh, minded, uh, certainly the experience in England, when the Afghanistan war broke out, irrespective of where you stood in terms of your viewpoint, um, within my own community, in the Amdiya Muslim community, yes, there were a variety of different opinions, many who didn't feel that the war was perhaps warranted, merited intervention. However, the war started, and in the case of the United Kingdom, troops were committed. And I remember cameras arriving at our mosque before Friday prayer, wanting to speak with the lady who had the strongest form of parda in terms of who was totally covered or the person who had the longest beard or whatever, because they had a pre-notion that, that that somehow signified some level or categories of extremism. What they found, on the contrary, was irrespective of what personal views were, many against the war, if not the majority and the overwhelming majority, that now the tr war has started, Islam also instills in an individual, as a Muslim, loyalty to your country. Of course you can challenge. Of course you can raise objections. However, you're also duty bound to be loyal to that country, that nation, that allows, as many countries across the world do, that allow you not only to practice your faith, not only to profess your faith, but go out and propagate and preach your faith, which all these countries allow you to do. So pray for that country, pray for the troops of that country in that they may be guided and pray for all of mankind in that these wars aren't something which become commonplace. But one thing that the media were looking for at that time were the burning of flags, so the burning of the Union Jack. They didn't find it. They wanted to see long chants and protests and placards against this, that, and the other. They didn't find it. And they spent hours trying to find someone who would come out with something which would feature and make a headline. They didn't. And that evening when I was watching the news, they finally had got one mosque in particular where unfortunately they were burning the flag, uh, which I personally find extremely appalling, and doing all the things that they sought. And the piece on the mosque where I was attending Friday prayer, they focused in and they said, meanwhile, in the London mosque near Putney, people went about praying in their usual way for peace. And they showed one chat after seven hours of filming, prostrating and getting up, and that was the sum of it. So I think the sensationalism that surrounds, unfortunately, a lot of where we are today, and it is an unfortunate fact that there are those within who purport to follow the faith, but in my view, 
are so removed from the faith, who give such a negative uh, perception of Islam, that it is important, I totally agree with you, that it is important that all people of Muslim inclination, but all people of faith, do stand up and be proud of their faith. Be proud of what your faith teaches you. Do not be scared to profess that you are a person of faith because faith provides strength, it provides guidance, but it also provides a deep understanding of mankind and a respect of people and views which are different to yours. And I think if that is the foundation of building a society, as the noble prophet of Muhammad demonstrated during his time in Medina, where different communities came to him and asked him to be the person who laid the foundations of the charter, because they felt that here was someone who could provide equality and protect all communities, including the pagans, from intrusions and attacks from others. So I think there's a living example in the noble example of the Holy Prophet of Islam, and all Muslims should be minded to really search those out, and that is the example they should be taking forward. Would you, would you say that uh, the truth uh, No. Well, again, this use of the fundamentalist, we could have a whole discussion and debate on this. But apostasy in Islam is not punishable by death, first of all. Let, let's be clear of that. It's uh, sometimes something which is extolled by others, but it's certainly not the view of our community. Secondly, as far as fatwas go, except, you know, life and death is very much in God's hands. It shouldn't be for men, people to decide. We're sitting in remote parts of the world to actually then suddenly claim. If, if someone, Rushdie, in that particular case, wrote a book, we'll write a book to counter it, you know, so, and have reasoned discussions and debates. Did I find what he wrote, and I did find what he wrote, was something which did hurt my sensitivities, but did I find offensive as a Muslim? Yes, I did. But the fact is that under the laws of the land, and he was allowed to do so. How you can respond to that is have a rational discussion without burning books without putting out fatwas, and actually have a very reasoned and balanced argument to present why you find such things offensive. And I think, uh, absolutely. And absolutely, I mean, more recent example with the cartoons, I think it's incumbent on every community, every society and country to have certain values of respect, respect of people, people's views, people's values, people's understanding of faith. And I think in that, you set up the basis and foundations of what's called a civilized society where mutual respect and respect of differences between people is something we can all live with. I often, we use the word tolerance, and all communities use that. But tolerance to me, ladies and gentlemen, is that a basic human value. It's a really good start. If you're, but tolerance means that if you're all sitting in here, and I've sort of turned up, and the fact you're still sitting here, maybe you tolerate me being here. You know, well, okay, that's a good start. But what's more important is the understanding, the next level, whereby you can say, what's your view? What's her view? What's my view? And that you can actually have an exchange, one of perhaps based on differences, and learn from each other rather than come out condemning each other. And I think that's an important basis. Indeed. Hearts and souls. Yes, sir. Yes, uh, just a comment, a single comment, if you don't mind. Uh, there is uh, one point which is uh, misperceived by many, even of the higher educated people, about uh, the main topic of the Duty Symposium, which is our prophet, peace of uh, The multiple marriage, uh, marriages that has been in his life. Uh, would you mind just to give us in a whole, uh, briefly about this point because uh, I am quite sure that it is highly misperceived and negatively used against uh, his holy life. Thank you. Well, one thing, and uh, Dullah Saab may wish to comment on this as well, but certainly if I can start it off in answering, I alluded earlier to the example of the Holy Prophet and certainly his, his first marriage with Hazrat Khatija may God be pleased with her, in, in the sense that here was a lady who proposed to him because she saw values, and they had a very full life, they had a very respectful life, she was a trader, she was a businesswoman, and he worked for her rather than 
her working for him. So these notions which sometimes existing, you know, the, the male, the gender is superior and the females in Islam have, or women have no role. Well, that's not, fundamentally it's not true. Secondly, the searching of education and knowledge is incumbent on every human being, not through gender differentiation, but through the fact of learning. The final thing on the question of marriages, there is a injunction within Islam whereby if there is an allowance, if conditions are such, and the needs at that time, for example, many wars were taking place and or that society was such that uh, certain moral degradation took place and women were subjected to the worst kind of uh, crimes which you can think of in terms of, of, of the person. And the injunction of the Holy Prophet was one of giving women rights. If you look at the history of Islam, women were given rights of inheritance, for example. When the Holy Prophet arrived in Arabia, when his mission was proclaimed, there was a despicable practice at that time of burying young girls alive. Um, and he stopped that and he gave a great respect and reverence to the role of women through all faculties of life. However, there was a provision made whereby that if certain conditions, and it was the exception, not the norm, which unfortunately, again, we were talking about practice and what happens. This isn't that if you feel like you can take a second wife or whatever, then you should do so. This was about ensuring that there could be a balance in society. There was issues around men not being, there were uh, out in wars, there were women who were being left unmarried, but there was also a provision within that to protect women and safeguard women, but only on the basis that the man, the husband in this case, could provide for all his, his first wife, his second wife, in a way which was economically balanced and he was able to show equality in that. And as I said, it was the extremity. It wasn't a norm, it was one of those principles to provide, if you like, a, mor a continuing moral degradation of society, to prevent further degradation and abuse of women in society. And it was done as a protective measure and an exception to the norm rather than a normal practice. It is unfortunate, I would end in this, and Abdullah Saab may wish to say, more on this, that there are some in the Muslim world who unfortunately have taken this and present it as a way that it gives them carte blanche to take multiple wives. It does not. And the prescription of that is, you know, whether it's seeking permission of first wife, there may be reasons that, or that the person has uh, medical reasons behind uh, a second marriage. Those are all due to the individual cases, but there are very strict criteria which are laid down in the dealings and the way in which um, marriage and the sanctity of marriage is protected. We know from the Holy Prophet Muhammad that he said once that uh, you are allowed to marry more than one wife, but there is a condition you have to uh, you have to behave with an equally, and you cannot. Yes. I mean, this was I mean a condition which he gave, which makes it really for a pious person, for a pious man, very very difficult undergo this uh, situation. So in certain situations, as uh, Lord Edmund has mentioned, you are allowed to marry a second or third wife. Um, in the uh, situation of the Holy Prophet Muhammad it was different. I mean, the only we consider today so-called attractive wife to him was, she was very young, was Hazrat Aisha. And Hazrat Aisha, may Allah be pleased with her, she is um, considered of one of the biggest narrators of Hadith. Yeah? She was a teacher in the early Islam who taught many men even the true teachings of Islam because she lived so close to the Holy Prophet Muhammad. And she was of young age. So for a long, long period, she was a leading figure for the Muslims because through her, uh, the knowledge about the Holy performance also was conveyed to many ladies, but even to many uh, men. Uh, there was a, a situation in the early days of Islam that in some situations tribes were fighting severely with each other. There was no unity at all amongst the Arabs. And sometimes, I mean, there were traditions through marriages uh, uh, People could be uh, peace, could uh, surrender to a certain I mean, uh, way of get together. So I mean, in this way, the only Prophet, Prophet Muhammad so sometimes was married sometimes to uh, certain I mean, members, even 
blood of his wife, she was a Jew. Uh, uh, he had, I mean, this experience, I mean, for a long period, but most of his, his time he lived, I mean, together with Hazar Pravisha, his first wife, and all other wives complained to him that he always talks about her in so high esteem that, I mean, uh, they claimed and, 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 and protested that, I mean, he is not equal to them, I mean, because he gave always the excellent example of his first wife, of Hazar Pravisha. I would like to make reference to 206 when Benedict made the region reaches the exchange. And after that, and after the controversy which happened, interfaith dialogue between the Christians and Muslims started. And uh, if I'm not mistaken, the movement or what I don't know to call it, the common word, common word was set up. And I think it is led, being led still at the moment by the King of Morocco. I don't know if I'm correct in saying that. And from your speech, do you think there is further scope besides um, interfaith dialogue between Christians, Catholics, and Muslims and praying together? If there is scope for social action together? At the moment, I am reading a book. My Lord Sachs, I'm sure you know. Yes. And the whole of the world together. Mm -hmm. In it, Lord Sachs gives many examples what together we can do to promote a better society. Do you think we can build on that further? The more the UK, the European Union. In, in, in a few words, what I'm asking you to comment upon is, can we find more occasions to do something together, constructively, besides dialogue, besides prayer, but this time social action for the common good? Uh, well, first of all, sir, I, I totally concur with your sentiments, and I think uh, the underlying need is one of humanity and service, and I think as a general example, there are many charities, for example, across the world um, of different inclination, of different religious mindset at times, who seek to serve humanity. And I think that is a very good and shining example that if humankind is in need of assistance, irrespective of who they are, where they are, and who and what your beliefs are, you seek to assist them. And I think there are many great examples, one can quote, of different charities across the world who do just that. You mentioned about uh, Lord uh, Sachs, Rabbi Sachs. He was, um, of course, a member of the House of Lords. He is the chief rabbi in the United Kingdom, a uh, very noble personage who's often and initiated, indeed I've spoken on a couple of debates which he's initiated, not just on the practical nature of interfaith dialogue, but as you rightly say, about interfaith initiatives. And one of the initiatives certainly I can highlight which my particular Muslim community, the Amnia Muslim community, undertook. And it's not a new thing. This was through the time of the second successor to who we believe to be the founder of the community, who set up a concept of religious founders' days, whereby it was an interesting notion, and I came across it at a very young age, whereby different religions were represented and brought in to talk about a particular subject. So, for example, charity or humanity in religion etc., different faiths, so Jews, Buddhists, humanists, whatever, of different uh, mindsets and ideologies. But one of the sort of more quirky elements to that was that get the Muslim to talk about the Hindu interpretation, get the Jew to talk about the Christian interpretation, the Sikh, so on and so forth. And that did one of two things. One, it brought people together, not just under a guise of interfaith dialogue, but it also sought that if I, for example, was going to go to this particular meeting to talk about charity, I wasn't talking about charity in Islam, I may have the subject charity in Buddhism or charity in Hinduism. So it allowed me as the speaker, as a Muslim, to go out and research a subject, but from another faith's perspective, to bring and present. But also in doing so, there was an underlying thought process behind that which is unity of purpose and unity of action. And certainly in my own Muslim community, I've seen that 
in real terms taking place to the extent whereby, as you rightly said, dialogue is one thing. It's about social action. It's about how, for example, as the community, my own Muslim community does, is raise money. So we have tomorrow evening I'm speaking at a charity event for the Amdiya Muslim Youth Association in the UK where they're raising money for different charitable projects in the United Kingdom. And these include, for example, local charitable projects which may be to raise funds to repair the roof of the local church. And I think these underlying the principles which were contained in the example of the Holy Prophet of Islam, when he himself, when he opened up places of worship, when I talked earlier of when engagement in conflict happened, he sought always to protect places of worship. There was a time when people came to meet him and there was time for prayer and they were Jewish faith and he actually said, well, use the mosque. You know, people arrived of the Christian faith, use the mosque. And I think that example, I found myself at times when a prayer, I may be traveling internationally, there's no mosque in, inside. I've gone and found a quiet pew in a, bre uh, in a church, sat there and contemplated in prayer. And I think those practical examples, the kind of examples and the numerous examples he gave, I think in the modern age, we do find. But let me reiterate once again, I totally agree the sentiments of uh, certain initiatives and leaders. And these has, have to come from the leaders. If you have the leaders of different communities, not just talking the same language, but demonstrating through practical efforts, commonality of purpose, I think then we're on to moving on to a much better place. I mean, uh, I think it is in the moment uh, the right time to do more interface dialogues. We have in the moment in uh, Europe 50 million Muslims living, if you conclude the Balkan states as well. And uh, I've seen in Germany it took a long time. They, I mean, they realized that they're an immigration country. But what I see now over there, there is really a competition going on, not only between countries, even between cities. We have really, in every city we have a round table, an initiative where with different religions sit together on one table to discuss things. We have a cultural I mean, uh, discussions going on in between different cultures. It is very, very important to do it on the grassroots level as well. And, uh, the Ahmadiyya Muslim Jamaat is on the forefront, I mean, to push especially Muslims into these activities. Because they come mostly from countries where you can't find religious freedom. Yeah? Where you find mostly political systems which are not allowing, I mean, to uh, have free speech and free talks about uh, politics or religion or anything else. Yeah? Therefore, it is so important to, I mean, even, I mean, move, I mean, Muslims, I mean, to act according to uh, a democratic, I mean, behavior. I think uh, things can even move in Europe, I mean, to uh, bring peace even to other countries. It is very important in the moment, uh, especially when uh, the countries consider Muslims as an integral part of the society. They have rights. But they have duties as well. They have to organize themselves in such a way that they can play a part in the society. I consider it, for example, very, very important that in schools, Muslims learn something about their faith. Because most of the Muslims today, they are not getting any understanding about their faith.